Hey there. Hello. Hi. Stefan, hi. Good. So I can see you. You're very grainy from uh, my end. I hope I'm not quite so grainy. <laughs> well, all I can say, Stefan, is you look a picture. Oh, that's very good. That's very good. Well, I'd picture like to say the same thing, you don't. You look, uh, you look like you're in a fog, actually, in a deep fog. Uh, <laughs> and you're one of like those scary creatures that come out of the woods and then uh, eat you or whatever. You know? So, um, But uh, I'm sure that's just uh, you. Uh, this is to do with my web. Yeah, anyway, good. Right, well, let's do two minutes, if I may. Just sure. say the words that I talked to you about. Uh, I'll ask Ben, sat next to me, Ben, uh, ben. to say a couple of words. Hi. And then we'll just we'll pause. We'll, will we need to go off camera to do that, just to play it back? Uh, yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, we'll do that, and then we'll come back on again live to go with it. Right. Okay? Perfect. Stefan. Good morning to you. Good afternoon, in fact. Good morning, Alan. Thank you. Stefan, it's a great pleasure for the University of Northampton to welcome you to this live uh, web link here at our third annual sports marketing conference. I'd like now to introduce you to my third year sports marketing graduate, uh, Ben Warren, who is going to ask you a short question. Hi, Stefan. Uh, just like to say, first of all, the opportunity for sports marketing students to be able to speak with a leading worldwide professor is absolutely fantastic so thanks for this opportunity um, and could you please give an intro introduction of yourself and a background to your career in sport management oh thank you very much ben yes so um so yes i uh, i'm an economist by background and uh i did a phd in labor economics and uh to be honest with you i never really intended to do anything uh related to sport. I was uh, never a great athlete, although I always tried, and um, I never thought of it as a research area. But when I was uh, a, a postdoctoral fellow, uh, we were trying, I was with a group of people who were trying to think about how uh, businesses can be successful in very competitive environments. It's very easy to understand how a business can be successful in a monopolistic environment, but when there's competition, it seems tougher. And so that's how we got to thinking about football and thinking about that as a very competitive environment. And uh, I, I started looking for data and found that actually you could get very easily uh, the accounting data for English football clubs. So I started collecting uh, football club accounts and relating their financial success to their success on the pitch. Um, and that's really been the foundation of my research uh, that started more than 20 years ago. And I still do research on English football club accounts. Um, but it's also broadened to think about um, some of the wider issues in sports, to think about the way in which leagues are structured, the relationship between clubs and administrators, uh, issues to do with competition law, and uh, really issues to do with business strategy about uh, how to design leagues in a way that is most effective, uh, and most likely to uh, attract the fans, and therefore most likely to generate income. I think, Stefan, if I may, from what you've said so far, we'll continue on this theme now. Uh, we have introduced here at the uh, the Business School in Northampton and in the conferences that we've done to date, to ask from practitioners, from academics and from students alike where they see the future, not only of obviously in your area, sport business and sport management, but generally the whole face of the future of sport. And maybe you might make a, a couple of comments on that particular strand construct of our conference today okay so so i i i i'm a i'm a uh, professor of sport management now at the University of Michigan. I moved here a couple of years ago from, from Cass Business School in London. Uh, and one of the things about living in America is you, you some, some ways living in America shows you what the future looks like. And the future is a world, if, if the US is anything to go by, where sports plays a bigger and bigger role in uh, people's everyday lives. It's, it's, uh, if you haven't lived here, it's hard to recognize just how much sports saturates life here. It's the everyday topic of conversation. And one thing, uh, unlike in, in Europe, for example, where traditionally sport has been male-dominated, that's really no longer the case in the United States. So, for example, 
everybody has a team, a man or a woman. It's no different. And moreover, uh, anybody under the age of 30 has usually participated regularly in sport through most of their school life and sometimes after school, again, uh, regardless of gender. So so one of the things is that, that, that sports are are taking uh they've always been important in people's lives but they're taking an increasing fraction of people's lives um the the second thing i think obviously is the globalization trend which people people started talking about globalization really in the 1990s uh when they talked about business in general but really if you think sports was is the precursor sports were well fifa was founded in 1904 so so in that sense football has had a global dimension for for a very long time and indeed uh, the world cup started in 1930 and you know we've had international competitions uh going back more than a century now um and that globalization is continuing. And of course, it's, it's enabled more and more by the media. Uh, and that's obviously the major theme of your conference. And I think it's important to recognize the, the transformation that's taking place now. The, the, again, the, the, the advances in new media in the last 20, 30 years are completely transforming the way we consume sport on a global scale. So uh, I think of sort of three examples here of, of, of the scale at which this is happening. So uh, one is obviously what the, the still the most commercially valuable uh, sports league in the world, the NFL. Um, the NFL now generates um, uh, more than $5 billion a year from broad broadcast rights alone. Um, Really, the crowd in the stadium are just extras uh, at, a, at, a, at a show which is being put on for a TV audience. Um, now, the NFL is, is in, in many ways in the lead in this, and they, 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 they marketed themselves as that kind of uh, made-for-TV sport right from the beginning. But everybody else is really having to follow uh, and that changes the way you think about the relationship. It changes the way you think about what's important about the sport, uh, particularly thinking about things like the broadcast values, the quality of the pictures, um, and thinking about related uh, uh, media uh, opportunities. Obviously, uh, through the Internet now, we look at a lot of opportunities through mobile uh, telephony um, and through um, social media, um, and that really is opening up. Uh, a big new areas of commercial development where there are enormous opportunities for people to make money, um, maybe in ways that the fans like, maybe the fans don't like, um, but I think that's, that, that's a very important aspect. Uh, a, a second example, obviously, is the English Premier League, which is, in many ways, I would think of it as, I think of it as being sort of NFL global, where they're now being able to reach into so many overseas territories that they're generating nearly half of their broadcast income from overseas sales, which is uh, unique still in the world of sport to generate so much of your revenue from abroad, um, but which means that increasingly they're less focused on what the UK market might be interested in and more thinking about what uh, global partners are interested in. And that is creating enormous op uh, commercial opportunities for, for Premier League and for the Premier League clubs. So you think about Manchester United uh, constructing these hundreds of micro-marketing deals in small countries or, or, or small smaller countries around the world, or maybe big countries, which are not traditionally uh, sources of revenue for sports teams. Um, and that's, that's really boosting their marketing revenues and is, is, is to, to a large extent, is the engine of their growth at the moment. Uh, and I think that's, so that's a, that's a second uh, uh, kind of important development. And then a third example I would give is in uh, cricket and the Indian Premier League. So the Indian Premier League is um, uh, a huge marketing phenomenon. Uh, the broadcast rights are worth uh, more than uh, $10 billion, uh, which for a cricket competition is extraordinary. Um, in uh, in a period of only five uh, years, they have gone from nothing to being uh, uh, the most dominant broadcast event in India uh, and also increasingly shaping the way the world of cricket is developing and obviously uh, shaping the way people think about the game and shaping the marketing opportunities in the game. Uh, 
and it's also creating problems as well. It's uh, pr creating pre problems in terms of conflicts with traditional structures of cricket uh, and uh, the IPL amongst administrators has as many opponents as it has uh, cheerleaders. Um, and uh, creating issues as we've seen now where there's a there's a big match fixing scandal obviously going on and, and creating because of, and ultimately because of political competition to control this incredibly valuable asset. So I think there's there's plenty of meat there for marketers and uh, a business management analysts to get into to think about how these these uh, these sports uh, these sports rights will will change, how these sports competitions will change in the future and the impact, the, the, the changing impact they're going to have on our lives and the, the, the business opportunities that are going to go along with that. Stefan, I think you've given us an absolutely fantastic insight for both myself, my colleagues absolutely. on the sports marketing student side and clearly, hopefully, um, our audience here gathered at the conference. I'm going to hope and request that possibly this time next year you can join us in person. But may I just, on behalf of everybody, here, say a massive, massive thank you. And I'm going to leave the last question, maybe for Ben, just to add something and ask you a final question before you leave us. Um, yeah, I, just on based on the the cricket, really, from a more a personal perspective, cricket's my my uh, my first sport. I just so do you, do you think that um, this IPL will spread uh, to other cricket playing nations like the uh, particularly in England? I know there's a lot of talk of of the 2020 being restructured. Uh, do you can you realistically see that happen in the next few years? Well, what I can certainly envisage is that uh, kids growing up who are interested in playing cricket are increasingly just going to want to play 2020. Uh, the key talent in cricket is if you're a batsman is going to be to hit sixes because that's what is being rewarded in the marketplace. So I think in that sense, the, the, the game is going to be changed from the bottom up. Uh, People will like uh, you will you will engage a broader audience, perhaps not a, a traditionalist audience, but you will engage a larger audience uh, if you have the uh, bish bash kind of cricket that the IPL provides. Um, and uh, it's no doubt in my mind that athletes will want to be driven towards performing in those kind of markets because typically athletes do go where the rewards are largest. So I think it's inevitable that that type of cricket will take over. But I think the other thing is that, that I, I, I doubt that any other country will be able to launch a competition that will be as dominant as the Indian Premier League. And I think, uh, again, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating um, indicator of the shift in commercial power around the world, when we talk about the, the rise of the BRICS and uh, China and Brazil and, and, uh, and Russia as being these new uh, economies which are, um, which are growing at very fast rates and starting to catch up with Europe and North America, but in the sports world, it's, uh, it, there, have been, there are very few examples of um, uh, uh, developing countries uh, being able to lay on major sports events and to steal the limelight, if you like, from the traditional uh, sporting powers. But it seems to me the in cricket and the Indian Premier League is 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 a great example. And I, and just in passing, I, I often wonder what would happen if, say, for example, the Chinese government looked at the success of the Indian Premier League and said, you know what, we have the resources to do this for soccer in China. But um, that, that's, a, that's a subject for, for another day. But can, can I just say it's a, it's a great honor to be able to, to talk to you like this. I really wish I could be there in Northampton. Uh, the topics that you have for discussion are really fascinating, and these are very important issues. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of things going to be said that uh, will be very valuable uh, for people thinking and going forward. Uh, so uh, I really do hope I'll be able to be there in person next year. But uh, in the meantime, can I can I wish you all the best and uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Stefan, that's just a wonderful way. It's not the finish, it's just the beginning. So we thank you again. You take care. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.